Welcome to the Classical Gab Fest, a weekly discussion about the ever-changing world of classical music. I'm your host for this week, Tiffany Liu, and with me as always are Kensho Watanabe and William White. This week we'll be discussing the San Francisco Symphony's reorg and rebrand. Then we'll look at a new violin method book made up entirely of music by Black composers. And finally, we'll talk with vocalist conductor Natalie Stutzman about her new album. But first, we like to start with our prelude segment. So, Kensho, what do we have today? This week, we'll be playing a round of everyone's favorite game, Match the Interpreter. If you search online for a Beethoven or a Mozart symphony, you'll come up with literally hundreds of different performances. And in the world of classical music, we like to think that every individual artist brings their own personal spin to the interpretation of works such as these. But the question is, just how audible are those interpretive fingerprints? In this game, I'm going to play the same excerpt as performed by three different interpreters, and it's going to be up to our contestants to see if they can match those clips to the three interpreters listed. This week, the focus is on cellists, and we're going with three cellists, Jacqueline Dupre, Yo-Yo Ma, and Misha Maisky. So before we start, what sorts of musical associations do you have with these three cellists? Well, I mean, I think the one the one of these that would have the biggest audible fingerprint might be Misha Maisky. I mean, he's known as something of a uh, loose cannon. He plays with a big sound, a big vibrato, very romantic over the top. And that's drawn some criticism. You know, Jacqueline Dupre is known as a very emotive performer as well. I don't know quite how much it comes through sonically. Of course, you know, she she died in what, like the late 1980s or something. So to an extent, her recorded output is going to have the sonic fingerprint of the recording technology of the time that she was recording in. So that might be a little bit of a cheat code here. And it also, I don't know if it'll be useful for a game, but it'll also have a narrower range just because she died so tragically young, right? I mean, she didn't have kind of different phases necessarily to her recording career the way that we know that um, really long-lived artists will have. Yeah, and then when it comes to Yo-Yo Ma, there's somebody with some real distinct periods to his playing. I mean, he was such a wunderkind, and he made so many important recordings when he was in his 20s. I guess that would be in like the 70s and 80s. And those recordings have a real clarity and precision. That's right. I think that with age, he has maybe gained a little bit more excess sound to his uh, playing, but... I don't know. This is going to be a tough one for me, quite honestly. Yep, it is, because as our listeners well know, none of us are cellists. So here we go. And let's see. I mean, if you were to think about an iconic cello excerpt, what would you think I would play for you all? Dvorak? Yeah, the Dvorak cello concerto, or maybe the um, Tchaikovsky variations on a Rococo theme. Well, you know how much I love that piece. <laughs> I don't know. But if it's as much as I like that piece, then it is very not... Well, if I told you that I am going to play the opening of Elgar Cello Concerto oh. as the excerpt, how does that change your thoughts in terms of Jacqueline Dupre, Yo-Yo Ma? I mean, Jacqueline Dupre is the one that is so closely associated with that piece, right? That's right. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. All right. Well, let's get on with it. All right. So here is interpreter number one. <laughs> Thank you. 
Okay, here is interpreter number two. <laughs> And finally, interpreter number three. All right. What do you guys think? Well, I'll go first. I mean, I, th I think it's uh, Misha Maisky, Jacqueline Dupre, and Yo-Yo Ma. I had Misha Maisky and then Yo-Yo Ma in the middle and Jacqueline Dupre at the end. Okay, so let's talk about Misha Maisky first. I mean, I think I, I thought that was very bold opening and then a big sound, a lot of vibrato and affectation, like doing the scales. It was like, Blum, 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 blum. Yeah, I mean, it reminded me of what you were saying about just him just sort of being a loose cannon. I mean, there are these people who feel comfortable plugging themselves into these almost improvisational vibes that are going on. And I feel like he's one of those performers. And that is a passage that I feel like if you asked him to play it twice, it wouldn't be the same that second time around. Mm -hmm. And that was the interpretation that gave me that impression as well. So now let's talk, I guess, about the... Uh, second and third. Yeah, excerpts. second and third. You know, I, I thought that the orchestra was much more present in this second one than it had been in the in the one that I think of as the Maisky one. Mm. And I don't know, there was, there was something sonically that I recognized about it that just made me think this is Jacqueline Dupre. I like there, there was a gliss at the end of her scales that I thought was sort of very characteristic of something she might do. I, I, would, I would even go out on a limb and wager that this is the Barenboim recording. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think the only reason I ended up with Yo-Yo Ma in the middle there is because I think of this interpretation as sort of what I have heard most as kind of standard, standard. in terms of the pacing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that brings up the question of why wouldn't I associate Jacqueline Dupre as the person who had purveyed the standard interpretation since she's so well known about this piece. But the impression that I remember having when I listened to her recordings is how like, she's not afraid to get into the guttural range of the sound of the instrument. And that was not something that I sensed in the second recording. It was very, it was quite clean to me, particularly towards the end of the excerpt. And then just, I guess, by process of elimination, which makes me feel very ashamed and like I should go listen to the Jacqueline Dupre recording again. I ended up with Jacqueline Dupre at the end. You know, it's funny. The third one for me had more of that. Like it had a brighter character, like on the A string. It, it just sounded much yeah. brighter and more clean and almost bigger. And I think of that as a Yo-Yo Ma hallmark. So if there's I mean, actually, if there's one thing that I don't necessarily associate with Yo-Yo Ma is that kind of bigger sound. But mm. it, you're right that it, it had some aspects of brightness to it. All right. Well, I guess we'll see what happens here. All right, so the answer was Misha Maisky first. Yes. Yoyoma -Yo <gasps> second. Yes. 
and Jacqueline Dupre as the third. So Tiffany, Tiff, big winner, big win there. Congratulations! Yay! Yeah, I think it was interesting. It, what revealed more was actually the second part of the the mm. opening. You know, I think there's some things that you could tell, but actually how they approached the quieter section and that build was actually probably the more revealing part of their styles. But super interesting. That just about does it for this week's prelude segment. But before we wrap up, we'd like to mention a special opportunity for our listeners. If you mention your love for the GapFest on social media or in an email to your classically inclined friends, tag or CC us, and you'll be entered for a chance to come on the show and participate in one of our prelude games. It's a win-win. You get the fun of a musical listening challenge and more people get to enjoy our wonderful show. And with that, we move on to our first topic. Will, what do you have for us? The current concert season is a strange time to be starting a new job, but that's exactly what Esapekka Salonen finds himself doing. The celebrated Finnish conductor and composer is now the music director of the San Francisco Symphony, taking over from Michael Tilson Thomas, whose tenure we reviewed in an earlier episode of this podcast. Maestro Salonen comes to San Francisco having led many of the world's most important orchestras, including the Philharmonia Orchestra and the Los Angeles Philharmonic. And yet he is trying out some rather new ideas with the SFS. The main innovation is that he is fashioning his own music director role as the team leader of a broad array of collaborative partners, artists from a variety of media and disciplines who are part of creating the institution's programming. The design team at this symphony is also taking this opportunity for a major brand and logo refresh, hiring the design firm Collins to create a, quote, type-forward new brand that's decidedly contemporary and dynamic, with an elongated serif typeface that, like music, shifts based on mood, context, and medium. Practically, this means that there's a whole website where you can go and sing at your computer and watch the text bump and bop around like little dancers. So, Kencho and Tiffany, did you play this little font game, and what did you think? Does it make the San Francisco Symphony seem cool and fresh to you? I mean, I guess in the constellation of professional orchestras, the San Francisco Symphony already seemed on the cooler and fresher side of that, (laughs) which is not saying a whole lot, but (laughs) I think that this is kind of a communication geared towards not us, right? Like, we're the people, if we lived in San Fran, we'd be going to the concerts anyway, high-quality orchestra. But this is geared towards people who are maybe not even musicians, or certainly not even classical musicians. I think that's very clear. Yeah, and I mean, did you guys take a look at their website as well? I think it's one of the more elegantly designed websites that I've seen in comparison to many of the other major orchestras. I mean, all their websites are just so blocky and just awkward and really impossible to navigate. And yet at this one, this is like very aesthetically pleasing. And it's not just one thing, right? This typeface is one thing, but it's the whole package of how to get people interested in the symphony, go to the website and also stay on the website. Because most of these websites you go to and you're just like, oh, okay, can't navigate it. I'm never going back there. I'm going to make a phone call to book tickets or whatever, you know? So this definitely helps. I hope, the younger crowd that are looking for those kind of other avenues of getting into it. Yeah, another thing to say about like how this new font and brand pervades the institution is that it actually is, is reflected in the physical infrastructure of, of the hall and the surrounding environs. There are pictures out there where you can see that like, the seating sections like terrace, you know, is written in this new font and like balcony and stuff like that. You know, they, they've put all of the signage in the hall reflects this new visual identity, which I think is pretty cool. I like that consistency. Whether I think that this particular font is like the end all be all of fonts or whatever, you know, I don't know. But uh, just just the fact that like when you go to the place, everything reinforces this design concept. I think that's pretty cool. And that consistency is hard for a, a, an institution, a large one, to really buy into because of how much money it takes to like redo all of the signage, all of the labeling. You know, like it's like you're talking about construction efforts. You're talking about doing all the, the stationery and the outgoing signatures, this kind of stuff. I mean, it's really quite an investment. I also appreciate that consistency, but you can also see from the angle of some other large organizations why they would be very hesitant to kind of buy in all into a typeface identity and maybe be afraid of getting it wrong. (laughs) Well, regardless of just what the typeface looks like, right, the message is everything that we're going to be doing 
is going to be inspired by music, right? The fact that this typeface is responding to audio or f- with music, because so much of these kind of huge institutions that have so many mechanical pieces, you know, sometimes the programming gets influenced by another department that needs a certain thing. And this, the idea that the typeface is now being inspired by music, it sends this message, whether it's real or not, that all the things that the orchestra is going to be doing is going to be coming from the music, inspired by the music, and radiating outwards. Do you suppose that you would get that message if you didn't read the language about the logo? Yeah, that's a really good question here because, because you know, so I guess it's it's worth trying to describe this typeface a little bit. Basically, you have letters of alternating heights. So, like, if I'm looking at just the logo of the symphony now, S is really tall. F is a little shorter than S, Y, M, P, H. Those start very small and they get bigger. So the whole thing looks like the bottom of like a xylophone or something. And the whole thing is top justified, which is actually another interesting aspect of their font. Right. And so and so it creates these curves in a single word or phrase. And the idea is that that is supposed to have a musical, melodious shape to it. So yeah, does that like, does that read to you guys? I mean, because frankly, like I saw the the new logo before I read about it. And I was just like, OK, logo looks kind of like a, vi- a vibraphone or something. Well, here's a word that gets used often in graphic design that I think also gets used in music in which they hoped would convey accurately with the logo, which is dynamic. The sense of movement in some way, which I do think actually is present in this logo. And, you know, the fact that that happily coincides with an aspect of music that we tend to buy into a lot. And I don't know if I would describe the shape of it as an, as having a melodic contour, but I do think that it does sort of mirror what I think is actually in their language, which is that it sort of looks like a crescendo in a way. <laughs> So so now let's do, well first of all you guys never answered the question about playing around with the the website did you do that and did you enjoy it Well I tell you I tried to I tried to put in classical gab fest and like capture a little gif with it responding to our theme music which I think I just like want to have as our little Instagram <laughs> something or other but <laughs> I I'm not savvy enough but it's very fun it's very cute to watch letters dance around I'm a big fan of animation and music anyway I mean I grew up on Fantasia like I just I can't I can't wait to do a segment on whatever successor to Fantasia comes out, hopefully in the next, you know, (laughs) decade or whatever. But it's fun to watch things move to music if the movement is really generated by the music, as we were saying. And I wouldn't call myself a typography geek, but I enjoy the effect of different types of typography. I think this is a really nice font, the kind of what I think they call it an exaggerated serif font and to watch it kind of dance around in response to music is fun because it does respond to obviously the dynamic the the loud and soft of it and it kind of the size correlates with that but there's there's a little bit of something I, I don't know what the technical word for it but like there's a little bit of like an after effect to where the letters will jump at a crescendo and then sort of like you know, jiggle their way down to size <laughs> as the sound decays. I just, I like all the little thoughts in the, in how the letters get animated. And yeah, it's just this kind of like sandboxy kind of way of also people figuring out how they got to this typeface too, right? So, I mean, like one thing that I would complain about is that it's not easy to find that website where you can play around with the font from the San Francisco Symphony. Oh yeah, we'll link Symphony. it in the show notes. Go play with it. Oh, of yeah, course but like yeah, you can't yeah. find it really in the San Francisco Symphony website. So that might be That's one true. that they're missing. That they maybe have, you know, it's like they've spent all this money and time and all of this. I mean, it'd be cool to just have like a, just a link, you know, to be like, hey, this is design your own, you know, font using our typeface, you know. Okay, so now let's talk about the, you know, the, the, this font is, is merely a reflection. Of a structural rebranding and reorganization. Yeah, reimagining of this. Let's, so let's talk about that. Yeah. What do you guys think of the uh, collaborative partners as a model? And did you have any thoughts about the particular people who were chosen to work with Asapeka? I, mean, I think language about reconstructing or maybe even breaking down hierarchy has always been sort of appealing to my generation anyway, our generation on a certain level. But the the manner and directions in which Esapeka has chosen to do so here are, I think, a very much a product of even the last five years. And so a lot of the effects of this, we're going to have to wait to see how, you know, their seasons pan out five, ten years from now, I think. You know, then we'll know, like, is this working? But it's certainly very modern approach, this kind of decentralized, multifaceted, multidisciplinary approach to leadership that reads super well to people 
in our generation and and below, which is really the, the demographic they're courting with all this. Yeah, and, and I mean, there's a reason that as a pick of sound and is the conductor that appeared in an Apple ad, <laughs> or you know, like he he is that he is the artist that is let's say forward thinking in this way. And but to be fair, I mean, everybody that's on this, most of these people that are, are the collaborative partners are musicians or artists, with the exception of Carol Riley, who's an AI entrepreneur and robotist. So that's that's kind of cool to see. I wonder like what kind of that's things that they'll very you know San Francisco. It's like yeah. if you're going to do that anywhere, this seems like yeah. If you're not going to gonna have one, then you're missing an opportunity. Right? <laughs> that's exactly right. 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 Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. So I mean, it'll be interesting to see what kind of collaborations will come from that. I mean, well, but, yeah, and like they're all amazing. I mean, Esperanza Spalding. I have like the biggest crush on like she's so awesome. <laughs> yeah. I mean, these are all the it's like the cool the cool kids club, right? Like yeah, that's exactly, like exactly Sisto, right. That's it's exactly right. Uh, you want to be in this club, right? Right, and it's <laughs> it's in that respect, it is. I, none of these come as surprises. Like these are the obvious choices in a lot of ways. Yeah. Okay, here's one slightly awkward question to ask about this. If you look at the top of the page of their creative partners, I noticed this too. They've got these eight people all wearing white like shirts and dresses and beyond that i mean they're all like have these weird far off gazes but they (laughs) look like they have been dusted with talcum powder oh yeah they look like corpses they look like washed out and and i mean like the white people look like whiter than any white people i've ever seen in my life (laughs) and the non-white people look awfully white (laughs) Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I actually noticed this too, and I wanted to bring it up because there are, you know, a couple people of color on this slate of artists, and here they all look like they're exactly the same skin tone, and that skin tone is rural white, and this just coming off of a, oh, it was in Georgia where, um, where there were ads being run against Warnock that artificially darkened his skin mm-hmm. to, you know, incentivize voters against him, which is just like. Okay, let's not even get get there. Mm-hmm. But like, this reads a little bit not so great to me in the same way. I did notice that. Yeah, what's up with that? <laughs> Why? I don't know. It's a strange choice. Even like forgetting the racial component for a second. Like, why do they look like they are in the Elysian Fields or like you know, like in a cloud someplace? That's really weird. To me, this is a an interesting experiment in orchestral leadership. You know, I. I will admit that I come from a school that sees the music director of of an orchestra as a bit of an auteur, you know, somebody who, yes, obviously has to work corralling the forces of many, many different people in many different lines of work and departments and stuff like that. But, you know, in in a way, I like there to be an artistic vision that's stemming from one person's imagination. But I'm very open to this. I, I do think that it's a cool reimagining of what it can be. And I'm curious to see what it's like. And, you know, I think that we'll have much more of a sense of what really happens with this um, in the post-pandemic times. But uh, listeners, we'd love to know your thoughts about any and all of this. And especially uh, if you somebody play... make us a logo. Yeah. Make us a, make us a, a visual font designed uh, uh, logo. Play with the bleeps and the bloops on the website. All right, with that, it's time for our second subject. Tiffany, what do you have for us? Music by Black Composers, or MBC for short, is an organization with a three-pronged mission to inspire Black students to begin and continue instrumental training by showing them that they are an integral part of classical music's past as well as its future. Second, to make the music of Black composers available to all people, regardless of background or ethnicity. And third, to help bring greater diversity to the ranks of performers, composers, and audiences, and help change the face of classical music and its canon. MBC is a division project of the Rachel Barton Pine Foundation and has undertaken a major publishing effort to add method books at every level to the curriculum for every instrument and ensemble. While recent events have obviously brought the organization and its efforts into the limelight, MBC has in fact existed since 2001, and today it has published a beginning violin method book, a black composer's coloring book, and several online directories featuring black composers living in historic, a black musician's discography, and a list of podcasts and radio programs. We here at the podcast decided to rifle through their violin method book, Beginner to Elementary Level, published in 2018 by MBC, which has been the subject of some recent discussion in violin pedagogy circles. 
The book is a solid 70 pages, published by Ludwig Masters Publications, and comes with a number of references to online recordings made by artists from the Sphinx Organization, a classical music diversity organization based in Detroit and dedicated to the development of young Black and Latin classical musicians. So guys, uh, what do you think? I think it's great. And I, what I really loved about it was actually, I was comparing it to kind of the Suzuki books, you know, the yeah. Suzuki introductory mm-hmm. instrumental books that I think it's pretty ubiquitous now, even in the States. And what I remember from my experience in Suzuki is that I would just learn the piece and have no idea who composed the piece. That's right. Because it was mm-hmm. just basically like, oh, like Lightly Row and like <laughs> Go Talent Roadie and like, oh, great. Like I finished that piece, you know, and I would have no idea who wrote these pieces or probably not even have the concept that somebody had written them right that the pieces just appeared and that's just what i had to do right (laughs) and here with each page or with each composer or piece there's a full page write-up and a picture of the composer and detailing a biography and then there's like even like vocab words that's defined for the student and so i love that i love that it's an educational tool not just for music but for just general awareness of history and society and all of that yeah, I also thought that this was great. This is a, seems to me a very valuable resource. You know, if I were to have any sort of critical view of it, it would just be like, who is this exactly for? I, because the writing level, and I'm wondering if you guys agree with me about this, because I'm not an educator. Take this with a grain of salt. But it struck me that the writing level was pretty high, like maybe <laughs> a high school level. And the excerpts that at least the ones that we looked at you know sort of the first part of the book you know this isn't like your very first thing that you would start with i don't think this isn't um mary had a little lamb or you know twinkle twinkle or something like that i mean it, it's already starting with some rhythms that are a little bit more complicated you know fourth finger that you would have to use where i, I don't know if like the very beginning suzuki uses that so i mean i i would say that this is already geared at like a maybe second or third year of playing student starting level. And so just the idea that like an eight or nine year old is going to read some of these descriptions of the aim of the book, you know, there's a lot of front matter and then read these um, descriptions of the composers, which I, they just struck me as, you know, middle school or higher. But you know what? I give them all the credit in the world for aim high in terms of the student's level of cognition and reading ability and let them get what they're going to get out of it. I mean, we learned last week that there's a big connection between the way that our brains function in terms of, you know, learning music and learning all sorts of other skills. So, um, you know, why, why assume anything less? So in the end, I thought, okay, this is, this is just all around good. Yeah, but don't forget the fact that like these beginning students are going to be going through these books with their teachers right it's not like they're going to be playing by themselves and so i think again it's it it involves a teacher to kind of either read it or explain who the composer is and that's that source or that tool is already in the book as they go through it and learn it together yeah in a way i mean because there is so much and the material is so robust this is usable as a resource in many different contexts you could see this being useful to say a general music teacher at uh, elementary or middle school level just for the pages where they talk about the composers and and give the little historical blurbs and talk about the vocabulary and stuff like that. And, you know, that person could, you know, use some of these things as, I don't know, for recorders or whatever, but just ignore the musical samples or, or you know, use the video material that they're producing with that. Yeah, I think it's manifestly clear that the passion project part of this was like not even the compiling or editing of the music itself which I mean in in a way it's to show that the music that these people were producing was no better or no worse than all the other stuff that we have canonized in the Suzuki repertoire it's just like here is another piece and these guys were writing it also at the same time and there's no reason why you know Suzuki should have picked you know the Verasini G the passion project part of this is obviously the stuff that's not the music and that's the part that obviously I'm going to learn if I'm going to read read this book, I mean, or if I'm going to have any use for this book myself, which I am, I'm going to read all the text in here. There's quite a lot of really good stuff. And, you know, put throwing that into the realm of like kind of private violin teacher, which I still am for a number of people. It's amazing to me, the intermediate students that I have who like have done, you know, five, six, seven, eight years of playing and have no concept of any composers. They just went through the book. 
you know it's just like Kensha was saying it was like um, and so like why not have why not just be a little dense I mean like even at you know 10 years old you should know what an encyclopedia entry looks like mm. well what about so um, I mentioned uh, in my intro that this book has been the subject of recent discussion in pedagogy so even though it's been out uh, since 2018 obviously with Black Lives Matter movement galvanizing our whole field to really look honestly and comprehensively at our educational literature, what recently happened was uh, the article that, you know, was more recent, which maybe brought this book to our attention, was that there have been projects about how to integrate resources like this into the curriculum. So we have this problem, right? We have people now compiling dedicated passion projects such as this book, which is really well done, and then publishing out there. And now we have a problem in the pedagogical field of how are we going to use this? I mean, you know, am I meant to use this instead of book two Suzuki? So the recent conversation has been like, which of the pieces and how do they make it into the repertoire? And for what purposes? What skills can you teach about using the fourth finger or about string crossings? Where in the pedagogical lineage do any of these pieces fit? And I think it's pretty clear that you oughtn't to be using this book as like a straight through method book in the way that the Suzuki books actually are constructed, which is to develop certain skills in a certain order. I don't think that that was part of the compiling of this particular book. Yeah, I mean, you ser- you certainly don't want this book to become like, oh, well, let's go to the other book that has all of the black composers in it, right? Like, that's 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 what we're trying to avoid. But at the same time, like, if this resource didn't exist, like, we wouldn't be having this conversation about integrating the, the curriculum either. Yeah, I mean, you know, I don't think there's any harm in saying, okay, we are going to go to this other book, but you need to tell teachers when. You know, like, is is it, like, between Lightly Row and Go Tell Aunt Rhody that, like, this one, you know, piece from this other book serves its purpose? I don't think that there's anything wrong with integration across different method books. But what's not clear is how exactly, like, sequence-wise, you know, something like this would fit into uh, the normal trajectory <laughs> of education for young musicians. Although I would say that just looking at the excerpts that I, that I looked at in this, I mean, it was pretty clear that this was a gradated, I mean, like, all the first things were in D major. And then mm-hmm. they got into G major and then they got into A major. And it's like yeah. you can tell how they're adding notes and strings and stuff. Well, and by the end of the book, it, we were progressing to like the entertainer, you know, and kind of syncopated stuff like that that gets into kind of ragtime almost. I mean, like also, I mean, we're speaking as if Suzuki is the be all end all of how to teach. Uh, yeah, and that's already starting to change, right? And that's changing too. So I think, yeah, I mean... It's just not centralized yet, right? Like, I think that people are just doing, teachers are individually doing what they think is right, but it would be nice to have something where we all agree that this this is also something that is extremely worthwhile to work into the, the curriculum. Yeah, but I mean, can't teachers sort of determine that for themselves? Like, an interested teacher can just get this book and be, I mean, is it that difficult to figure out? Like, okay, well, you know, this one looks roughly equivalent to this one. I just uh, It's surprisingly it difficult. Is it? I will say, from a first-person point of view, uh-huh. like, like, trying to get, I mean... Boy, it's a godsend to have a pedagogy book that goes in the order, you know, and like for you to try to like be trying to compare 50 different books looking for the piece that's going to teach this skill but not get into the weeds about something else that has been completely foreign. I mean, it's hard. Hmm. It's really time consuming and not a fun process, Hmm. frankly. But maybe that's why I'm not a career violin teacher. <laughs> but I also like the fact that these are duets. So the Suzuki book is usually just like one violin line with an accompaniment for piano or something. And then you learn that way. But this one is in a way like either the teacher plays the second mm-hmm. violin part or the other part. Or you have kind of a social aspect of, you know, getting two violinists together that are almost the same level and getting mm-hmm. them to play together, which is also a nice thing. It does also come with a piano accompaniment book, which I also have. But it's nice. I agree, Kensho, that the basic is two lines that can yeah, be played by two violins. Awesome. That's really good. Well, um, violin teachers out there specifically, I mean, like, I, I got this book as an effort in my own education, and I'm going to start throwing, you know, pieces wherever I can find them. What I only regret right now is I can't play any of these duets with my students right now. So i um, love to know your thoughts about this book and other, other projects that are similarly well curated and really well published. I mean, frankly, this is like a nice thing to hold, and I'd love to know about more like it for my own edification and also for the general uh, well-being of our field. So, um... Let's go on to our third topic for today. Kensho, what do you have for us? Natalie Stutzmann is an internationally recognized conductor and contralto who was recently appointed principal guest conductor of the Philadelphia Orchestra starting in the 2021-22 season. 
She is also the chief conductor of the Kristiansand Symphony Orchestra in Norway. Back in January, Natalie released an album entitled Contralto, in which she conducts and sings with Orfeo 55, a chamber orchestra that she founded in 2009. This album is a celebration of 18th century divas for whom many operatic roles were written by composers such as Vivaldi and Handel. These women were at times overshadowed by the spectacular fame of Castrati during that time. Natalie puts the spotlight back on these women by including the name of each diva for which the aria was written alongside the name of the work on the album. Let's hear a clip. We at the Gabfest really enjoyed listening to this album, and we are delighted to have Natalie join us to talk about Contralto. Natalie, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Kencho. So as we were listening through this, and some of these tracks are actually world premiere recordings of pieces, I wanted to know about what your research process was, how you started to kind of be aware of the presence of these wonderful voices and how you decided to create this album. You know, the moment where I just realized how great were those ladies and how much they inspire the composers. When you when you read some uh, some words of Vivaldi saying how much he's kind of upset that he always have to write for Castrati instead of contralto voice that he loves, he has written all this beautiful sacred music for the the ladies which were the young ladies which were in the Ospedale della Pieta, which was a uh, like, um, how do you say this pensionnat, you know, this place for young ladies who were abandoned. And many of them had low voices and he was totally in love also with one of the girl and he wrote a lot of things. And then, you know, that was the first start of the idea. And then I thought, let's have a look about who sang what and who uh, inspired the composition. And the second kick was one of my favorite aria from Vivaldi which is this Gelido in Onivena. I sang it uh, many times. And uh, recently I heard it always sing by countertenors. So I was myself absolutely persuaded that it was written for a castrato. And when I found out it was written for a women voice, and I said, no, we have to do something to rehabilitate those ladies who have done so much. Then I started my research really based on the name of those ladies and that's why it was very important to me uh, that it was written on the CD cover a real tribute to all those persons who have been so incredible artists with lots of different qualities to have a a tribute to them and um, it was also um, as I always like to do to have those very famous big arias and completely unknown new discovery if they are beautiful because we have heard a lot of new discovery sometime, which should stay <laughs> undiscovered. <laughs> Being a female with a with a lowish voice myself, I've always noticed this about, you know, not just our landscape, but the pop landscape as well. Like we're so obsessed with males and females who have higher range voices. Like the 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 pop landscape is all unbelievable tenors and our landscape particularly with the music from this era for females is all 
you know, soprano coloratura type kind of stuff. And what's what's all that about? And also, let's make our best pitch to people as why we should be kind of amazed at the lower range and what it what that carries. People are absolutely persuaded that the higher it is, the more difficult it is. <laughs> it, it's funny, you know, it, it's like, it's kind of bling bling effect. Yeah. <laughs> you know? It's like a Christmas tree, like yeah. the more lights you have, the more expensive is the Christmas tree. <laughs> Not knowing how hard it is to, to build up a low register, either for men or women, beautiful bass voice or beautiful alto voice, are voices that you really have to care to build up because it's it's not the normal voice. Actually, the normal voice for a woman is a soprano, mm-hmm. and the normal voice for a man is baritone. This kind of gender voice, and then every everyone except this is already an abnormality. Uh, it's interesting, and it is also maybe, you know, a, a high note is something spectacular, and probably something which can be appreciated by everyone who even doesn't know or like or cherish classical music. Yes. So a, a low register voice or a low register instrument has always a different repertoire, which is based much more on deep sentiments, soul. Alto voice are the, the voice of the earth, uh, of the mother, it's it's Erda in the ring, or it's mm-hmm. uh, it's very sensual, or it's a La Fitzgerald voice. So it's it's something which touched to something more disturbing because it's much more personal. I think it's much more intimate, and some people can be even disturbed by this uh, sentiment. No. Uh, Natalie, I am familiar with your work as a singer of Lieder and of this wonderful Baroque repertoire that you do. And I was wondering, though, so many of these pieces on this album and from your previous albums with your group Orfeo 55 come from the world of opera, and you sing them so dramatically. I mean, really, it has so much color in the voice and so much emotion but are you an operatic singer? Have you played roles on the stage? I, I, I have never come across any of your work in that regard. Yeah, well, I did, you know, alto voice have this reduced repertoire because in the, in the Baroque and classical area, there was a lot of hero spots. And I sang those heroes, those the Hosen role, we say, the trousers role. I sang Giulio Cesare, Rinaldo, all these big Handel operas. But then when you come to, to the, the repertoire after, the heroes are sopranos because it's a young lady, so you need a high voice, or the tenor, of course, because it's a young guy, beautiful, pretty, singing, dancing, whatever. And then the alto is always the old lady or the <laughs> mammy or the grandma or the sorceress, the nasty one. So it can be sometimes sometime interesting, but it's, it's basically, I mean, the parts are not interesting. Musically speaking, you know, someone like me, I feel frustrated. So I didn't sing so much opera. I sang those parts. And when I started to sing uh, Giulio Cesare, all those parts, then came this uh, fashion for Contenor. And, you know, I, I grew up in my concert repertoire. I, I was singing much more um, romantic repertoire for 20 years. Also, the Baroque repertoire is much more obvious for such a voice as mine. But, you know, I always love to push the limits everywhere. I said, oh, why you contralto cannot sing Poulenc and Foray and Debussy and Ravel, which, which was, I think no one has done it before me. Mm. And I just wanted, I, I love to show that if your voice is flexible and imaginative, and if you can have a, a range of colors, which is rich enough, you can sing a lot of more repertoire. And it was, it was fun for me, musically speaking, to touch all of this. And it was also growing up as a musician, dreaming to be a conductor, to be almost all the year with big symphonic orchestras, singing with Karayan, singing with Rattle, singing with all those people was uh, fantastic. So I, I was a bit neglecting the Baroque repertoire. And I came back to it when I built up this chamber orchestra in the wheel to say, oh, well, let's do something crazy, try to sing and conduct in the meantime. And explore a repertoire which is marvelous for a low voice and which I have not really explored. 
Speaking of conducting and singing, what is the recording process like? Because I'm sure you've, you've recorded so much as a singer and I'm, I'm, you recorded as a conductor, but to be in both roles, because you know that in the recording booth, especially with a conductor and a soloist, there is an interesting dynamic that is happening in terms of regarding takes and how much time to spend on this and all of this. So when you are one and the same, conductor and the soloist, is there more conversations that you have internally or what is that dynamic like for you? <laughs> So, you know, we have we have these brains separating two, you know, so you have one for your managing your energy and your voice and the other one for the orchestra. <laughs> so you just need double energy, double <laughs> concentration, double of everything. It's just it's so exhausting. It's it's completely nuts, to be fair. Also, I must say, actually, the recording process doing both is crazy in energy speaking, but it's not so difficult as the concerts that I was doing with the orchestra because simply, first of all, I wanted to have a lot of concerts before we record. Hmm. Because the process of my work was, you know, with this orchestra, I always work the same. New program means three, four days rehearsals. At least two full days, only a conductor work, making the orchestra playing, doing what you want, phrasing, shaping, preparing, Bearing the scores, breathing here and that and this and the colors, blah, blah, blah. When the orchestra knows, and it was an orchestra with a lot of people I worked regularly, so we know each other. When the orchestra knows what you want, then you start to add the voice progressively. And this, and here I sing this like this, and I would like this like that, blah, blah, blah. And then when, when it's done, you do concerts. Concerts exercise in singing and conducting is crazy but fantastically uh, fun for me, for the audience, for the musicians, you know, being, a, being an instrument in the middle of instruments with the chance as a singer that you have your arms free. So you can, you don't have to, you know, with the bow <laughs> or whatever, yeah. whatever. <laughs> and uh, when we came in front of the mics, it was just, you know, first of all, I am facing the orchestra. So I, the position is different. When you have the orchestra back and you have to sing for the audience, in the time we had audience, you know, remember a year ago? <laughs> yeah. So you have the audience in the back. This is really difficult. But when you record and you are up, so you can spread the energy a bit more with your voice than with your arms and body language that you do with the, con uh, the conducting. So in a way, the recording is just about how to deal with the energy, because if you talk too much, you lose your voice. So you, the orchestra has to be ready and you just have to be in a good shape and get the right pop up at the five minutes you have to sing. And there are some clips on YouTube where you see, and I have to do, I move a lot, but it's just because it's probably after four hours of heavy work already. And I have to, I don't know where to find the extra energy I need for them because when they, we are down and what the area, you have to finish the area. So you have to push for them, but then you, you need your own energy. So it's, yeah, it's a bit crazy, but, but really exciting. Let's talk about the album itself. Is there a kind of a trajectory that you feel with that happens throughout the album? Are there high points that, that you feel like, you know, if somebody's listening to this for the first time, where should they go? Uh, what, what's the story of the album? You make a plan table for a big Christmas party with, with uh, 25 people. Do you do, do, do you do a draft, you know, when you put mm -hmm. people on oh, this one with this one? No. Oh, this one with this one. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Well, actually, it's a bit how I work, you know. Uh -huh. Hmm. I must admit, I, I think I did almost 50 different order. Wow. Because it's, it's, it's very difficult. You know, I start like, like building up a, a concert program because I always, I know that today there are not so many people who will listen to the album from the beginning to the end. Yes. But still, I want to build the album like I would be the concerts with this arch of being able to listen to the full recording without feeling bothered by anything which doesn't connect well or without most important than everything destroying the magic of each aria or each uh, symphonic moment with the wrong order before and after and when you start to do the puzzle it's it's unbelievable how important one piece can 
prepare the next one. Um, and it, it's quite a fascinating process, but it takes a lot of time and a lot of different tries. So what I do, I just basically try to find what would be the most exciting first movement to, to bring people with you. With what would I like to finish? For example, in this album, this album is the last album I will do with Orfeo 55, who was my baby for 10 years. Mm. The orchestra is not existing anymore. And I want to have a tribute to them. So I wanted to finish with this little symphony of Vivaldi. And my recording company said, no, 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 you can't. It's a singer album. You cannot finish with the orchestra. I said, I will finish with the orchestra. <laughs> and see, I love this symphonia because it has the energy in the first movement. You have this nostalgia and this uh, tristezza in the second one, which is goodbye. And I will miss you a lot. And in the third movement, you just have this like, let's enjoy life anyway, you know. I love to sing. And also, you know, how to connect some tonalities. When I choose the symphonias, um, I try to imagine already in symphonia, which would be an introduction to the aria, because I always found uh, singers, recitals, either on a CD or either in a concert, when it's only voice, 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 I hate it. <laughs> it's bored. After a while, you don't want to hear any voice. You need to, to clean up the ears and have some pure instrumental music and to build up like this, the, the program is interesting. Yeah, I thought it was so beautiful, the interspersing of those instrumental interludes. Because, And I would seriously quibble with that characterization of it as a vocal album for that reason, actually. It's interesting to hear how you chose some of those, because, I mean, the instrumental pieces, they, they were not the most obvious selections. I mean, you have uh, Handel Ariodante and Amadigi. You know, I had never heard these pieces before, but they were they were lovely. But it wasn't like you chose the Sinfonia for one opera and then sang an aria from that opera. But I love I love how you say that this album was also a celebration of your colleagues at uh, Orfeo 55. And the, the aria I wanted to ask you about with regards to that is this Vivaldi from Tito Manlio, which is basically like a epic, long cello duet. <laughs> Tell us about this aria. Maybe tell us a little bit about the cellist, because I mean that that person was an amazing player as well. Yes, uh, this cellist is Alice Cocard, and Alice joined the ensemble quite recently, probably two or three years before we stopped. And she's a young French uh, cellist with a, a modern instrument, cello player. She's also teaching cello, and she loves the viola da gamba. She loves the cello, uh, baroque cello, and she she is a you know multiple talent person. And uh, it's a beautiful story because actually she was dreaming to work with me because her mom was having all the time playing my CDs at home. Oh. So when, when she was already uh, growing up with the cello, for her, her mom was saying. If you hear Natalie's cello voice, you will play oh. cello properly. Oh my and when gosh. she auditioned for me, she, she was so young and she told me nothing about that. But I, I just found she has a, a wonderful expressivity and talent. So I picked up and I was so happy to play with her. And in this album, I wanted to find an area where she had a solo. And um, I was searching and searching to find that and I, this i picked up this area because i thought the solo would be great for her and uh, it's very challenging for the for the voice this area because it's a lot of agility and it was great to keep our agility together with alice who is a very talented person so i'm really happy you picked up this area 
Well, Natalie, this is such a fun album, and、um, we just can't wait to share it with our listeners. And listeners, please check out this album. And also,、uh, we'll link in the show notes one of the videos of Natalie singing and conducting. It's a fantastic YouTube link. Thank you so much, Natalie, and we're so happy that you're willing to stick around to recommend something to our listeners for our classical mixtape. In our classical mixtape, we each recommend some music that's caught our ear this week to share with our listeners. So, Natalie, what do you have this week? Well, actually, I was thinking of something a little rare that I discovered quite recently.、Um, maybe you know it, but we were talking about those beautiful low register deep voice, and one of the voice which touched my heart more than anyone else on earth was always Jacqueline Dupré. And there is this amazing、uh, Jacqueline Dupré recording of、uh, this concerto from Boccherini, and when I want to reconnect to the deep joy of low voice, I hear the second movement of this concerto, and just the way she enters. I mean, this first note, the way she develops it, is exactly what I've tried to do all my life with my voice, and she's so amazing. She breaks my heart just with the first note. How she plays it, and it's 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 just something you you need to know and hear. So I hope you will enjoy to listen to it. Well, Natalie, thank you so much for this recommendation, and thank you so much for joining us on the podcast.、Uh, Tiffany, what's your recommendation today? This is a recommendation I actually really wanted to make last week、uh, because of our discussion about Irish music. But I'm pushing it to this week, and also happy that we did a cello prelude today because my recommendation is Victor Herbert's Cello Concerto Number、no. Two in E Minor. And the recording that I actually grew up on this, I could not find on YouTube. So here is an equally strong one by Gautier Capuçon, with Pavo Yervi and the Frankfurt Radio Symphony Orchestra. Oh, Frankfurt Radio Symphony, my favorite. <laughs> Very nice. Thanks for that recommendation, Tiffany. Kensho, what do you have this week? So I'm happy this week because I'm actually working,、uh, doing my doing what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm workshopping Kevin Putz's new opera that is going to be premiered at the Met、uh, in a few years, and so I've gotten to spend a lot of time with not just his music but also Kevin himself. And so, yeah, in a little bit of a tribute, I am. Recommending a choral work that Kevin has written, entitled "If I Were a Swan," and this particular performance is by the vocal group Conspirare with Craig Hella Johnson, conductor.
Kencha, this is a, a rare surprise from you, an a cappella choral piece. I'm delighted to hear that. And uh, I did not know this piece. It's very cool. It, so f to make for a slightly strange mixtape, uh, we've, we've had two cello concertos, and now we're going to have two a cappella choral pieces, because I have also chosen such a piece. Now, I wanted to bring this actually to you two guys, largely because of our review of Natalie's album. You know, there were a lot of pieces by Handel, Vivaldi, but then there were some lesser known composers, and one of these was Lotti, L O T T I. Did either of you know any of his music beforehand? Mm -mm. I only know one piece by Lotti. He's another one of these kind of one hit wonders, and especially who turns up in the choral world. The piece by Lotti that every choral musician knows and loves is his Crucifixus for Eight Voices. And it's particularly apropos since we are in the season of Lent. This is a very um, penitential kind of piece, a very moving, dark masterwork. It's short, it's but it's just so gorgeous. And this is a, uh, a performance by the Talus Vocalis. <laughs> of those each of those dissonances you know ramping it up oh my god it's so amazing what did you guys think did that have any effect on you i thought they were a little out of tune at the end there <laughs> <laughs> like the opera voices end up super sharp <laughs> sorry better sharp than out of tune as we say <laughs> fair you'll find the links to all of these and to our full classical mixtape playlist in the show notes and with that, it's time to wrap up this episode of the Classical Gabfest. I'm Tiffany Liu, and on behalf of Kensho Watanabe and William White, I'd like to thank you so much for listening and to encourage you to subscribe and rate us on Apple Podcasts. We'd also love your help spreading the word about the show on social media, where you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can reach us at classicalgabfest at gmail.com, and we'd love to hear from you. Until next time, happy listening, and we'll be with you next week. <laughs>